Hello everyone, and in this video I'm going to be talking to you about a few ways in which we can measure respiration. So experiments that we can do to look at the rate of respiration under different circumstances. The first way in which we're going to talk about measuring respiration is using a piece of apparatus called a respirometer. A respirometer is a piece of apparatus that takes advantage of the fact that when organisms respire, they take in oxygen from the environment. So they're removing a certain volume of gas from the environment. Obviously, under normal circumstances, organisms would take in the same volume of oxygen as the volume of carbon dioxide that they would release. And so the overall volume in a particular area would remain constant. But if you can add something to that environment that would absorb the carbon dioxide that was being released, you can measure the volume of oxygen that's being removed by measuring the change in volume of gas in the area. And that's what a respirometer does. So we add a substance called potassium hydroxide. Potassium hydroxide solution absorbs carbon dioxide and we can use that therefore to measure the volume of oxygen that's being uptaken by a particular organism. So let's look at the layout of a respirometer. What do we need? Okay, so let's see what we've got here with this respirometer. So we can see here in test tube A, we've got potassium hydroxide solution. Now, there are two ways you can set up test tube A. In this one, you can see that I've put this wire cage and in it there is an inert solution, which is exactly the same volume as the solution of the living organism on the other side, which in this case is seeds, but it could be anything. Instead of using an uh, inert material that's the same volume, you could use water to the same volume. What matters, though, is that it's the same volume. In test tube B, we've got our wire cage containing, in this case, seeds, but it could be any living organism. You could put some wood lice in there, or if you had a big enough respirometer, you could put a mouse in. And at the bottom, we've got our potassium hydroxide solution. So in the very middle, we've got our capillary U-tube, which contains a colored liquid, and you can see the ruler along the side. So essentially, this tube is filled with a colored liquid. We've put the whole thing in a water bath, which is set at 20 degrees. This is to ensure that the temperature remains constant throughout the experiment and so that temperature fluctuations do not affect the rate of respiration and therefore do not affect the results and also that temperature fluctuations do not affect the volume of the liquid inside the tubes. And then at the top, we've got this one centimeter cubed syringe. Although this isn't important for carrying out the experiment itself, this is important so that you can reset the, the level of the liquid between each repeat of the experiment. So let's think about how we would carry this out. So after we'd set it up and we put our water bath on at 20 degrees, we would leave it for a bit. We'd probably maybe leave it for 10 minutes with the tap attached to tube A, which we can see here, uh, left open and the syringe from tube B off. So the whole thing is exposed to the air in the environment. Why would we do that? First of all, to ensure that an equilibrium is reached between the inside and the outside, between the apparatus and the atmosphere, and also to allow for any expansion or pressure change within the apparatus, and then to allow the um, respiration rate of the living organism, in this case the seeds, to stabilize so that their respiratory rate is constant. Why did we choose 20 degrees? 20 degrees is about right for the optimum growth rate of the seeds, which is what we want, and about right for the optimum temperature for the enzymes that are involved in respiration in plants. So we would change the temperature of this water bath depending on the type of organism that we were using. So what would we actually expect to see happen once the experiment started? Well, we would expect the seeds to perform respiration. So we would expect the organism in tube B to perform respiration and no respiration to be occurring in tube A. Because the potassium hydroxide absorbs any carbon dioxide produced, over time, the seeds will be absorbing oxygen from the air in their environment. Any carbon dioxide they give it 
they give out will be being absorbed by the potassium hydroxide. And therefore, the volume of gas in the area of tube B will decrease. And so the pressure in tube B will decrease. The coloured liquid will be drawn down its pressure gradient and will move towards tube B. As it moves towards tube B, you can measure the distance it moves by looking at the amount that it travels downwards against the ruler on the board. And that will tell you the amount of oxygen taken up. An alternative way of doing it is at set intervals, for instance, every minute, you could move the plunger on the syringe so that the red liquid goes to where it was originally. So you would add air into the chamber. As you do this, you can record how much air was needed to be added to tube B to bring the red liquid back to where it was originally. And you can use that as your measurement for how much gas had been removed from the system. So let's imagine that after completing this for 10 minutes, we calculated that in 10 minutes, 2.5 centimetres cubed of gas had been removed from the system in 10 minutes. And we had put into tube B 1.8 grams of seeds. And you have been asked to calculate the rate of respiration in centimetres cubed per gram per hour. So the first thing we would do is we would have to scale that 2.5 centimetres cubed in 10 minutes up to an hour. So we would times 2.5 by 6 and it would give us 15 centimetres cubed of gas in 1.8 grams of seeds per hour. But we need to turn that into 1 gram of seeds. So we would do 15 divided by 1.8 and that would give us 8.3 centimetres cubed of gas per gram per hour. If you were asked to calculate it per minute, we would just divide it by 10 at the very beginning instead of timesing it by 6. Always make sure you check the units. We can use machines like this to measure something called the RQ value. RQ stands for the respiratory quotient. This equation is RQ equals volume of carbon dioxide given off divided by the volume of oxygen taken in. So if we just remove the potassium hydroxide solution that absorbed the carbon dioxide given off, we would then be able to calculate an RQ value. So what we know is that different substrates give different RQ values. So if an organism is respiring carbohydrates, it has an RQ value of one. That means for every molecule of carbon dioxide given off, it takes in one molecule of oxygen. For protein, it's about 0.9 and for fat, it's about 0.7. If the RQ value is higher than one, it suggests that the organism is doing anaerobic respiration. So if it's a little bit higher than one, it suggests that it's doing a mixture of both aerobic and anaerobic respiration. And the higher the RQ value is, the more anaerobic respiration that that organism is doing. Why? Because you are giving off more carbon dioxide than oxygen that you are taking in. So you must be looking at a, at a yeast or plant cell which is doing the alcoholic fermentation pathway and giving off carbon dioxide. Let's imagine that we wanted to measure anaerobic respiration in yeast. If you want to measure anaerobic respiration, you essentially have to remove the yeast's access to oxygen. You can do that in one of two ways. First of all, you could set up a flask or test tube of yeast culture in a glucose solution and place a layer of oil over the top. And that's a really quick fix because that layer of oil prevents the entry of oxygen into the system and the yeast can't access the oxygen and so it has to do anaerobic respiration. Alternatively, you could place the yeast solution in a closed environment for a set period of time. So you could place them in the flask for one hour or two hours before starting your investigation and you would know that all of the oxygen will have been used up in that time and so the yeast will have to rely on anaerobic respiration. So let's take a minute now to look at both of those examples. 
Okay, so let's look at experiment A. So we can clearly see that the layer of oil is preventing the entry of oxygen into the yeast glucose solution. So the yeast has no access to oxygen, so it's forced to do anaerobic respiration. And we know that it's producing ethanol and giving off carbon dioxide as a waste product. That carbon dioxide will be trapped in the gas syringe. We can measure the volume of gas in the gas syringe over a set period of time in order to indirectly measure the rate of respiration. If we collected 10 centimeters cubed of gas, over a 60 minute period and we had five grams of yeast in our yeast solution, we could use all that data to calculate the um, centimeters cubed per gram per minute. And that's quite a simple calculation. We would also expect that over time, the gas production would decrease. And let's think about why that would happen. Well, respiration relies on resources. In the case of anaerobic respiration, it's relying on a supply of glucose. And over time, glucose as a substrate will run out because it's all being converted into product. So as the glucose reduces, so as the substrate concentration drops, the rate of reaction will drop because it will lower the number of successful collisions between the enzyme and the substrate. Never forget that everything in biology is enzymes. The answer is always enzymes. Everything in biology is controlled by enzymes. So you've got to link things back to the things that affect enzyme activity. pH, temperature, enzyme concentration, substrate concentration. If these things change, these things will affect the rate. Let's just imagine if we were to get rid of that layer of oil. So now the yeast has access to oxygen. It's still going to be a finite amount of time it can do respiration for because it's going to have a finite supply of glucose and a finite supply of oxygen. But we would not expect the gas syringe to move at all. Take a minute to think about why that is. Think about what you learned about the RQ value. So we are doing aerobic respiration. We're aspiring carb carbohydrate. So we have got an RQ value of 1. For every molecule of oxygen taken in, we're giving out one molecule of carbon dioxide. So there's o overall no volume change in the environment. There's overall no pressure change, and so the gas syringe won't move. Let's just take a minute to look at experiment B. So it's got a slightly different setup. Instead of preventing the entry of oxygen, we're absorbing all of this oxygen. So we've put in a chemical here called alkaline pyrogallol. So with something like this, we're going to be getting rid of the oxygen in this environment before you start the experiment in one of two ways. So at first, the yeast in our yeast glucose solution would be doing aerobic respiration and using up the oxygen that way. And secondly, our chemical would be absorbing the oxygen. So we would need to leave it for a certain period of time to ensure that all the oxygen had been used up. And after that point, we would start our experiment. And that's really important. So once the experiment starts, the yeast will start to give off carbon dioxide. As it's giving off carbon dioxide, this will increase the volume of gas in the environment. And so it will cause the liquid to be pushed along in the capillary tube. And the movement of this liquid is the way that we can determine the volume of carbon dioxide given off over a period of time. Now, there's a little bit of maths you might be expected to do here. So this is called a capillary tubing. So this is a, a circular tube. So you can kind of think of it like a cylinder. So in order to calculate the volume of gas that is being created, we need to think about how much of this cylinder is being filled. So let's imagine that over a period of time, the colored liquid moved two centimeters. So say, let's say it moved two centimeters in 10 hours. And we knew that the diameter of the lumen of our capillary tube was one millimeter. Well, we would need to know the volume of the capillary tubing by looking at the volume of a cylinder, which is pi r squared l. And we know pi is 3.14, that's what we're going to use it as, and l is length. So we could then calculate the volume of gas given off in one hour based on that information. So if we are plugging in pi r squared l, we need to calculate r. So one error that students sometimes make is not ensuring all their units are in the same form. So we are being asked to calculate it in centimeters cubed per hour. So we need everything to be in that unit centimeters. So we've already got it in a length of two centimeters. 
So we need to turn the radius into centimeters as well. So if the diameter is one millimeter, the radius is 0.5 millimeters, and 0.5 millimeters is 0.05 centimeters. So we would do 3.14 times 0.05 squared times two, which would give us 0.0157 centimeters cubed per 10 hours. So then we would divide that by 10, and then that would give us 1.57 times 10 to the minus three, in one hour and that is a way to express that number in standard form so that's how you could use those numbers that you would get from an experiment like this to calculate the rate no matter what sort of experiment we were doing whether it was a an experiment studying anaerobic respiration in yeast or using a respirometer or any sort of experiment in biology we like to do repeats Repeats are really, really important. And we can either do repeats by um, you doing the same experiment over and over again and collecting your results, or several people doing the experiment and you pooling your results. Why is this useful? Well, first of all, it's really important so that we can identify any anomalies. Perhaps one uh, person did the experiment slightly incorrectly or something went wrong along the way and theirs really doesn't fit the general trend. So we can remove we can identify and remove anomalies. That's a really important one. The second thing is the more data you have, the more reliable the mean that you produce at the end of it is. So it allows uh, for an increase in the reliability of the mean. Finally, the bigger the data that you have, the more able you are to use a statistical test. And you know that in biology A-level, you need to learn about three statistical tests. Can you remember those statistical tests? Just a quick recap. So there's the chi-square, where you're comparing observed and expected values. There's the t-test, where you're comparing two means. And there's the correlation coefficient, where you are looking at the strength of a correlation between two variables. One other statistical test that we might carry out, we might talk about a lot in biology A-level, is standard deviation. Standard deviation is something that you'll have come across lots of times before, so I won't bang on about it too much now. But just remember that standard deviation is looking at the spread around the mean of your data, basically by just removing any uh, extremes of data. And whenever you're looking at data, if the standard deviation is high, then it makes us really question the validity of the data so we perhaps wouldn't trust data so much if it had really, really high standard deviation because it would suggest there was a huge spread around the mean. It would suggest that our data was not very precise, so it wasn't very clustered around our mean. And whenever we're trying to look for trends or patterns in data, we want to check that the standard deviation bars don't overlap, so there really is a true difference uh, between one point and the next. All right, so hopefully that's been useful in looking at different ways of measuring respiration and different experiments you might come across. This was quite a long video, so well done for listening.